American Government, Chapter 1, Principles of Government, Section 1, Government and the State. Today the United States is at war. That war, the war against terrorism, is a new and different kind of war against a new and different kind of enemy. The conflict began with the sudden and shocking violence of September 11, 2001, when terrorists hijacked four airliners. They crashed two of them into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York City and another into the Pentagon. The heroic actions of the passengers on the fourth plane forced it to crash into western Pennsylvania, short of its intended target, which was prob probably Washington, D.C. The government, acting with the full support of the American people, began to respond to the momentous and monstrous assault immediately. President Bush vowed that the nation will answer these attacks with rid, which rid the world of evil of terrorism. Congress quickly authorized the president to use all necessary and appropriate force against those who brought it, this war upon America. Government in this country is now focused on the fight against terrorism at home and abroad. Still, government has many other tasks to perform. It is crime, protects civil rights, and regulates trade. Although Americans disagree on America's on a government's role in providing services, today's government also provides for education, guards the public health, cares for the elderly, and does much, much more. What is government? Government is the institution through which society makes and enforces its public policies. Government is made up of those people who exercise its powers, those who have authority and control over the country's people. The public policies of government are, in short, all of the things a government decides to do. Public policies cover matters ranging from taxation, defense, education, crime, and health care, to transportation, the environment, civil rights, and working conditions. The list of public policy issues is nearly endless. Government must have power in order to make and carry out public policies. Power is the ability to command or prevent action the ability to achieve a desired end. Every government has and exercises three basic kinds of power. One, legislative power, the power to make laws and to frame public policies. Two, executive power, the power to execute, enforce, and administer law. And three, judicial power, the power to interpret laws, to determine their meaning, and to settle disputes that arise within society. These powers of government are often outlined in a country's constitution. A constitution is the body of fundamental laws setting out the principles, structures, and processes of government. The ultimate responsibility for the exercise of these powers is held by a single person or by a small group, as in a dictatorship. In this form of government, those who rule cannot be held responsible to the will of the people. When the responsibility for the exercise of these powers rests with the majority of the people, that form of government is known as a democracy. In democracy, supreme authority rests with the people. Government is among the oldest of all human institutions. Its origins are lost in the mists of time. But clearly, government first appeared when human beings realized that they could not survive without some way of regulating both their own and their neighbor's behavior. The earliest known evidences of government date from ancient Egypt, more than 2,300 years ago, the Greek philosopher Aristotle observed that man is by nature a political animal. As he wrote those words, Aristotle was only recording a fact that even then had been obvious for thousands of years. What did Aristotle mean by political? That is to say, what is politics? Although people often equate the two, politics and government are very different things. Politics is a process, while government is an institution. More specifically, politics is the process by which a government decides how power and resources will be distributed within that society. Pol politics enables a society to decide who will reap the benefits and who will pay the costs of its public policies. The word politics is sometimes used in a way that suggests that it is immoral or something to be avoided. But again, politics is a process, the means by which government is conducted. It is neither good nor bad, but it is necessary. Indeed, it is impossible to conceive of government without politics. The state. 
Over the course of human history, the state has emerged as the dominant political unit in the world. The state can be defined as a body of people living in a defined territory, organized politically, that is, with a government, and with the power to make and enforce law without the consent of any higher authority. There are more than 190 states in the world today. They vary greatly in size, military power, natural resources, and economic importance. Still, each of them possess all four characteristics of a state, population, territory, sovereignty, and government. Note that the state is a legal entity. In popular usage, a state is often called a nation or a country. In a stricter sense, however, the word nation is an ethnic term, referring to races other than large groups of people. The word country is a geographic term, referring to all particular places, regions, or areas of land. Clearly, a state must have a people, a population. The size of that population, however, has nothing to do directly with its existence of, as a state. One of the world's smallest states in population terms is San Marino. Bounded on all sides by Italy, it has only some 25,000 people. The People's Republic of China is the world's most populous state, with more than 1.25 billion people, just about one-fifth of the world's population. The more than 285 million people who live in the United States make it the world's third most populous, after China and India. The people who make up a state may or may not be homogenous. The adjective homogenous describes members of a group who share customs, a common language, and ethnic background. Today, the population of the United States includes people from a wide variety of backgrounds. Still, most Americans think of themselves as exactly that, Americans. Just as a state cannot exist without people, so it must have land, territory, with known and recognized boundaries. The states in today's world vary as widely in terms of territory as they do in population. Here too, San Marino ranks as one of the world's smallest states. It covers less than 24 square miles, smaller than thousands of cities and towns in the United States. Russia, the world's largest state, stretches across some 6.6 .6 million square miles. The total area of the United States is 3,787,425 square miles. Every state is sovereign. It has supreme and absolute power within its own territory and can decide its own foreign and domestic policies. It is neither subordinate nor responsible to any other authority. Thus, as a sovereign state, the United States can determine its form of government. Like any other state in the world, it can frame its economic system and shape its own foreign policies. Sovereignty is one of the major characteristics that distinguishes the state from all other lesser political units. The states within the United States are not sovereign and are not states in the international legal sense. Each state is subordinate to the Constitution of the United States. Every state is politically organized. That is, every state has a government. Recall, a government is the institution which society makes and enforces its public policies. A government is the agency through which the state exerts its will and works its Accomplish, and it works to accomplish its goals. Government includes the machinery and the personnel by which the state is ruled. Natural law is the law that would govern human beings in a state of nature if government or laws imposed by humans did not exist. Natural law includes standards of justice that transcend laws made by humans. Some thinkers argue that any human-made law that conflicts with the universal justice of natural law is not really a law. Others argue that government is necessary to avoid what the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes called the war of every man against every, every man. Without government, said Hobbes, there would be continual fear and danger of violent death and life would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Major Political Ideas for centuries, historians, philosophers, and others have pondered the question of the origin of the state. Over time, many different answers have been offered, but history provides no conclusive evidence to support any of them. However, four theories have emerged as the most widely accepted explanations for the origin of the state. The force theory, 
Many scholars have long believed that the state was born of force. They hold that one person or a small group claimed control over an area and forced all within it to submit to that person or group's rule. When that rule was established, all the basic elements of the state, population, territory, sovereignty, and government, were present. The Evolutionary Theory Others claim that the state developed naturally out of the early family. They hold that the primitive family of which one person was head and thus the government was the first stage in political development. Over countless years, the original family became a network of related families, a clan. In time, the clan became a tribe. When the tribe first gave up its nomadic ways and first tied itself to the land, the state was born. The Divine Right Theory the theory of divine right was widely accepted in much of the Western world from the 15th through the 18th century. It held that God created the state and had given those of royal birth a divine right to rule. The people were bound to obey their ruler as they would God. Opposition to the divine right of kings was both treason and mortal sin. During the 17th century, philosophers began to question this theory. Much of the thought upon which present-day democracy rests began as a challenge to the divine theory of uh, king's right to rule. The notion of divine right was not unique to European history. The rulers of many ancient civilizations, including the Chinese, Egyptian, Aztec, and Mayan civilizations, were held to be gods or to have been chosen by the gods. The Japanese emperor, the Mikado, governed by divine right until 1945. The social contract theory. In terms of American political system, the most significant of the theories of the origin of the state is that of the social contract. Philosophers such as Thomas Hobbes, James Harrington, and John Locke in England and John, John Jacques Rousseau in France developed the theory in the 17th and 18th centuries. Hobbes wrote that in earliest history, humans lived in a state of unbridled freedom in which no government existed and no person was subject to any superior power. That which people could take by force belonged to them. All people were similarly free in this state of nature. No authority existed to protect one person from the aggression of another. Thus, individuals were only as safe as their own physical strength and intelligence could make them. Human beings overcame their unpleasant conditions, says the social contract theory, by agreeing with one another to create a state. By contract, people within a given area agreed to give up the state, give up to the state as much power as was needed to promote the safety and well-being of all. In the contract, that is, through a constitution, the members of the state created a government to exercise the powers they had voluntarily given to the state. In short, the social contract theory argues that the state arose out of a voluntary act of free people. It holds the state exists only to serve the will of the people and that they are the sole source of political power and that they are free to give or to withhold that power as they choose. The great concepts that this theory promoted, popular sovereignty, limited government, and individual rights were immensely important to the shaping of the American governmental system. The Declaration of Independence justified revolution through the social contract theory, arguing that King George III and his ministers had violated the contract. Thomas Jefferson called the document pure lock. The Purpose of Government What does government do? You can find a very meaningful answer to that question in the preamble to the United States Constitution. The American system of government was created to serve the purposes set out there. The United States, which had just won its independence from Great Britain, faced an altogether uncertain future in the post-war 1780s. In 1781, the Articles of Confederation, the nation's first constitutions, created a firm league of friendship among the 13 states. That league soon proved to be neither firm nor friendly. The government that the Articles established was powerless to overcome the intense rivalries and jealousies among the states that marked the, same, the time. The Constitution of today was written in 1787. The original states adopted it in order to link them and the American people more closely together. That Constitution was built in the belief that in union there is strength. To provide justice, said Thomas Jefferson, is the most sacred of the duties of government. 
No purpose, no goal of public policy can be of greater importance in a democracy. But what precisely is justice? The term is difficult to define, for justice is a concept, an idea, an invention of the human mind. Like other concepts such as truth, liberty, and fairness, justice means what people make it mean. As the concept of justice has developed over time in American thought and practice, it has come to mean this. The law, in both its content and its administration, must be reasonable, fair, and impartial. Those standards of justice have not always been met in this country. We have not attained our prof professed goals of equal justice for all. However, this too must be said. The history of this country can be told largely in terms of our continuing attempts to reach that goal. Injustice anywhere, said Martin Luther King Jr., is a threat to justice everywhere. You will encounter this idea again and again. Order is essential to the well-being of any society, and keeping the peace at home has always been a prime function of government. Most people can only imagine what it would be like to live in a state of anarchy, without government, law, or order. In fact, people do live that way in some parts of the world today. For years now, Somalia, which is located on the eastern tip of Africa, has not had a functioning government. Rival warlords control different parts of the country. In the Federalist Number 51, James Madison observed, If men were angels, no government would be necessary. Madison, who was perhaps the most thoughtful of the framers of the Constitution, knew that most human beings fall far short of this standard. Defending the nation against foreign enemies has always been one of the country's major responsibilities. You can see its importance in the fact that defense is mentioned far more often in the Constitution than any other function of the government. The nation's defense and its foreign policies are but two sides of the same coin, the security of the United States. The United States has become the world's most powerful nation, but the world remains a dangerous place. The United States must maintain its vigilance and its armed strength. Just a glance at today's newspapers or at one of this evening's television news programs will furnish abundant proof of that fact. Few people realize the extent to which government acts as the servant of its citizens, yet you can see examples everywhere. Public schools are one illustration of the government's work to promote the general welfare. So too are the government's efforts to protect the quality of the air you breathe, the water you drink, and the food you eat. The list of tasks government performs for your benefit goes on and on. Some governmental functions that are common in other countries, including operating steel mills, airlines, and coal mines, for example, are not carried out by government in this country. In general, the services that government provides in the United States are those that benefit all or most people. Those are the services that are not very likely to be provided by the voluntary acts of private individuals or groups. This nation was founded by those who loved liberty and prized it above all earthly possessions. They believed with Thomas Jefferson that the God who gave us life gave us liberty at the same time. They subscribed to Benjamin Franklin's maxim, they that can give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. The American dedication to freedom for the individual recognizes that liberty cannot be absolute. It is instead a relative matter. No one can be free to do whatever he or she pleases, for that behavior would interfere with the freedom of others. As Clarence Darrow, the great defense lawyer, once said, you can only be free if I am free. Both the federal constitution and the state constitutions set out many guarantees of rights and liberties for the individual in this country. That does not mean that those guarantees are so firmly established that they exist forever, however. To preserve and protect them, each generation must learn, must learn and understand them anew and be willing to spread and stand up for them when necessary. For many people, the inspiration to protect our rights and liberties arises from deep feelings of patriotism. Patriotism is the love of one's country, the passion which aims to serve one's country, either in defending it from invasion or by protecting its rights and maintaining its laws and institutions in vigor and purity. Patriotism is the characteristics of a good citizen, the noblest passion that animates a man or woman in the character of a citizen. As a citizen, you too must agree with Jefferson Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty.